Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second episode of our second season of the Sachsenberg webinars. Um, I'm pretty excited about today's session. With me today is Yuan Fu Yun. He's a, quite a well-known viticulturist, and he'll share a lot of his knowledge with, with all of us today. So I'm very excited to, to hear what Yuan um, has to say. So just before we get started, the normal housekeeping stuff, um, we will be muting everyone. Um, so but you feel free to ask any questions. Um, really, well, I encourage you to ask questions. So just put it in the comments and we'll, we'll get to them throughout the webinar. Um, and then we will post the details of how to purchase Saxonburg wines at the beginning um, and at the end of the, chat, of the webinar. Um, so please feel free to uh, send, send those orders through. We're, we're working hard to get all the orders to everyone. Uh, it's been fantastic to be able to, to send our wines out again. So welcome, Johan. It's great, it's great to have you on our webinar today. Um, just for everyone that do not know who you are, just give us a bit of background about how you got into viticulture and yeah, where, where the love for that started. And then also what your career has been, what, what, what you've done in your career up to now. Okay, that's very, I love that first of all, everyone. Um, yeah, it's uh, my childhood, I was, uh, exposed to the vineyards of the of the Cape coming from the Karoo where I grew up and um, I went to study viticulture and enology and I farmed for a couple of years uh, wine and export grapes and then I joined the team at Vinpro and I was a consultant there for around 13 years in which I consulted to to I started out in the Swartland region and Siederberg the whole upper olifant refer and then uh, I migrated slowly as as the demand was or following you know the demand uh, consulting to more and more to wine the wine estates Paul region Franco region Stellenbosch the, 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 the coastal region today I'm I'm consulting you know all over the coastal region and we can say um, yeah in 2000 and I uh, the owner of that stage who just bought Normandy in front of the farm and we joined forces and started a, started up a, a small boutique winery here and um, I'm, I'm, since then I'm making wine here together with um, yeah as a leading the leading the project and um, we focus on high-end wines uh, small just three wines and then uh, I'm consulting I started my consulting business in 2013 so that's what I'm doing today consulting to a couple of selected uh, niche or wine estates and teams projects that I love working with and love working with me and uh, making, making and being busy with my own wine on the side. Fantastic you, you, you also work quite a bit uh, with quite closely with a nursery for a while. Yeah, for the past six uh, or seven years, I worked very closely with a large vine nursery. And uh, I've always had a love for, for the vine and the diversity that we have in clones. Um, yeah. So that was a great opportunity and I enjoyed it very much. And you know, it's, it's an integral part of what I do because I'm, I'm very much involved and uh, it's a sort of a speciality of uh, uh, developing farms or on new projects where, you know, a complete new estate yeah. or today we replant a lot, um, like you also do on Saxonburg. So yeah. to, to have a knowledge and understanding of vines and clones and, and all, the, um, all that it offers is, is, is definitely a huge part of every day. No, definitely. I I must say, I think it's some, sometimes people forget about the importance of of choosing the right the right plant material, um, and it's what what the effect is because it is such a such a long long term project. Um, but just so before yeah. we get before we get in delve deeper into all of that and into the more technical stuff, just maybe give us a bit of background into what is the clone actually, uh, and what is the difference between a, a clone and a cultivar. Yeah, so cultivar, a, a wine grape variety or cultivar is the same thing. So 
uh, that is, as we know, Sauvignon Blanc today or Merlot, for instance. Those are uh, varieties or cu cultivated variety. Yeah. So that is what we make wine of as a single. Um, a clone. So what happens is it's it's. I don't want to. Uh, we we want to keep it easy, but um, it is quite it is quite technical. So a clone. What happens in nature? Uh, wine like many other flowers the small bunch which which become a flowering bunch uh, before it you know uh, berries starts to develop berries so the um, pollination of those flowers it happens in the flower itself so um, it's a hermaphroditic so the vine can um, pollinate itself like most yeah. flowers are there but yeah. what happens so what happens sometimes is you get um, small DNA changes, which is, let, we can almost say it's a freak of nature. So there's small changes in the DNA that happens and that, can, that is called a mutation. Yeah. Now there are many mutations that happen constantly in nature, but because of the incredible diversity, if you can imagine any, every single uh, flowering, uh, great berry was initially a flowery, a small flower, yeah. and and all the mutations goes unnoticed, or most of them. Yeah. So there's millions of them that happens, but as soon as a vine, uh, a mutation came and it becomes noticeable. So someone noticed, and that's viticulturists or breeders, people who spend really hours and hours their lifetime in the vineyards and you notice a change. So this particular vine, and sometimes it's the only a part of a, of, a, of a total vine, only one, one shoot can constantly bear a grape with a different color or with a different size of berry. Then when that is taken, that specific branch and is propagated and it is uh, over a period of years of seasons established to consistently uh, continue to produce that unique characteristic that was noticed in the field yeah. then then that becomes a clone so it is the same variety but it is a mutation that happened that was noticed a very unique distinct difference so it's either smaller berries or constantly it gives a higher crop or whatever you know there, there are there are several yeah. things we can get to so that's how you get a clone it is something that was noticed it is, it is almost an it is a natural um process that happened and that was noticed and taken so further and um, it's basically selecting it's, it's the same variety yeah, it's selecting the, the more favorable mutations almost. It's doing a selection of those and then propagating them and establishing new vineyards with these more favorable characteristics on the specific, from that specific plant. Um, yes. Is basically, and, and basically what it is. So it's all this, yeah. And, and the, I think the big thing to note there, I think people are always, one, as soon as you start talking about Reading programs and stuff, people are always worried, oh, it's GMO or it's genetically modified or anything like that. And it's important to note that it isn't at all. It is just the natural selection um, that they go and they work off of natural uh, mutations that happen. Yeah, uh, so that's where clone comes from. That. And it's very important that the older, so it's, it's I can just want to say quickly that the, uh, to, to, to get a new variety, a new grape variety, Yes. That is, it happens only, it can only happen by having a, it like I've read about, you know, so it's a, it's a um, sexual reproduction. So you need two different um, yeah. male and female from different varieties, existing varieties to cross pollinate. And okay. that can happen in nature and it does happen, but it is also extremely rare to be noticed but it does happen and then it is actively uh, pursued by breeders great breeders or breeding programs internationally there are there are institutes in france or in europe or in the states wherever in south africa we have 
uh, breeding white or favor grape breeding programs, but it's it's it takes your life. It's a yeah. extremely 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 time consuming in terms of really literally years of cross breeding and then to getting to a variety that is the result of crossing two varietals and you establishing something that's new that's that doesn't didn't exist before so yeah. if you if you take clones the amount of clones that's available for each varietal is a function of the age of the varietal so the younger a varietal the lesser clones will be available because there wasn't that those years to to notice new you know small changes in the field so okay. all varieties they've got the most clones available so we've already we've we've already got two questions just on that one the first one is um who who certified clones is it universities is it nurseries who actually who's the board that certifies and and you know actually gives these clones a name We are usually it is a, the institution uh, where where the clone was um, in South Africa, for instance, it would be one of the plant improvement organisations because you need a, a body yeah. that's that's got recognition. So you, yeah. they will they will they will take this because a clone now is something unique of a variety that you've seen. So you now you need to to prove you, you know that it is consistently unique. Then over a lot of, of years, you need to you need to to propagate that vine, um, those vines. You need to evaluate them, and very intensively through a reputable evaluator, mm -hmm. and then you can establish a new club. So yeah, okay. it will have to it will have to come through a, a very well recognized and established institution. Up okay. today, you know that you can dis we can distinguish through DNA testing, uh, the difference between varietals. If you, if you only have two parts of a plant, we can, almost all gray varietals today are, are coded. So DNA coded, so we can identify what variety it is. But between clones, it's, it's extremely rare and difficult um, to, to distinguish on a DNA test. So, you need to have a very clear visual proof that yes. there's a noticeable, yep. unique characteristic or more than one to claim a new clone. Okay. Oh, that's very interesting. And on that, well, um, there was one other question uh, that was, do clones mutate further? And I think that, that does happen. It just, it, there's no set rule for how long it is going to take or if it's going to mutate or not going to mutate. It's ever it's ever mutating. Every year it produces flowering bunches because we want grapes from it, so they must be flowering flowers to, to become yeah. a berry. So yeah, mutation in new clones it's ever evolving. So you get an, a clone of a clone that's but it remains in the same varietal. So that's why then if you look at, at old vines and in, in old vines in South Africa is any vine over over thirty five years old is certified well, is now certified as an old vine they actually they're not necessarily resembling of their original clone they can be completely individual vines yeah no they can they can be um if if it wasn't noticed and and eventually um, identified or tagged as a new clone number it it always carries the clone number as the yeah. original mother plant, as we call it. So it's, it's a very inter intricate system, the whole plant propagation system and the scheme that we have in South Africa. Um, and I think it's important to understand that all vine material are vegetative, vegetatively pro propagated. So it, there is it, every vine in terms of the vineyards that we have out there are also in the true essence of the meaning of the word is they are clones so they are exactly the same dna if you plant a new vineyard of cabernet sauvignon and there's three thousand vines in that vineyard they are established by picking stems cuttings propagating them in the nursery we graft of course uh, we, we put it on a rootstock and then 
it's all exactly the same DNA, but there could be mutations in that. Yeah. But it wasn't noticed. It wasn't noticed, and and you know, well, that's there as a new clone. I think that's that's part of that's part of the fun. You know, that's what what I love about winemaking personally is is that there's so much you know you can you can work towards and pinpoint and it work perfectly, but there's always this unmeasurable something and that you really, really can't pinpoint that goes through even in the vineyard like you said now with 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 the plant material that you use uh, another question that we got through is is mutation are mutations stimulated by the plant trying to adapt to its environment so you know different will mutations happen differently in different parts of the world um, so that's almost a you know a natural response to to adapt to yeah. the environment sure i I think that's. I would. I want to say yes. This is a. There's not a. a I don't have an answer. Exact answer. I don't think there is an exact answer. I. I want to. I want to believe yes that it. There is a. To a. To a certain extent, an adaptation to the. Adaptation to the. Um, specific. Area. You know the the country or the, the region where it is, but um, I think that's a very difficult one to establish. <laughs> I agree with you. And then, just so new clones and, and new cultivars are continuously developed, and it's important to have you know systems in place where we're always where the industry, as the South African wine industry, is always developing new clones and cultivars to stay relative and and to move with changing time. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the the breeding programs that we currently have up and running in South Africa? There's only one breeding program uh, program at the the Intutec um, Mitchell Bay Institute. Okay. Um, it's 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 unfortunately very costly because you can you can have a breeder. Um, so so the yeah the, the time consuming aspect means and the cost comes into the person who runs it and not just a single person but um, you know it's 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 salary you need to really occupy a person completely a, a, a capable person that understands genetics and the whole process of of of, um, of uh, breeding uh, and it's because of the small the extremely small size of a of a um, bunch, great bunch, and the flowers on it. So you need to to be extremely careful in nature. You need to go up there and do the pollination and so on. Um, yeah, so it, it's uh, very costly, and therefore, unfortunately, we don't have a very um, reputable program. We we've had legends um, that bred Pinotage, for instance, um, but. The, the the better programs to mention that comes that, that are owned by government that spends a lot of money on it uh, you know they are out of France and Italy and um, and the United States for instance so yeah unfortunately we don't have a very strong program and the the strongest buying breeding programs are in the area of table grapes because they are much they, they have a much quicker result and they could capitalize on it and it's privately owned so it is um, commercialized uh, yeah. and, and it's extremely protected. Okay. So yeah, I think I, I think I only said part of your question, <laughs> please just rephrase again. What? That, that, that's perfect. That actually leads me on to another thing I wanted to ask. So where do we, so do we bring in a lot of plant material then mostly from France and, and Italy and and the United States, where they have strong breeding, breeding programs. Yeah, it's a, it's it's again a, a complicated um, situation. In the past, way way back, you know, uh, if you know the the world is, is today, it's very small, but it's incredible to see and impressive to see. They, there is a vine um, collection at. Uh, Cultivar or varieties and clones at, at um, the Info, Info, uh, Infotech Nitro Bay um, farm uh, on the Infotech Nitro Bay farm, Stellenbosch. And it's, it's incredible to see the, 
diversity of of wine grape varieties that's completely you know not cultivated out, outside of that of that plot in South Africa in the wine industry that's already here in South Africa um, and how did they how did those material come here it's through our uh, science, uh, researchers that travel the world and we had you know we, we are over the many many decades involved with universities and institutions across the, the globe so we've exchanged plant material um, okay. so yes there's a lot of plant material here but uh, some of those material are in a very bad shape at the moment because of infection of liberal virus um, so they need to be put through certain um, you know, through virus clean programs. So it makes it very difficult again and very time consuming. It takes many years to, to get clean outside on the other side of virus cleaning. Um, so yes, what happens today is that, that there's, there suddenly came a, a cost and a, a commercialization of selling grape, grape varieties. So these uh, governments or, or private institutions spend a lot of money on breeding new clones and new varieties or, or excuse me, breeding new varieties and selecting new clones. So they sell it for a royalty. So that's mostly how we get our new um, material into South Africa. You sign up with them. It's very, very... Um, complicated agreements that you, you're not allowed to, to propagate and deal with the material. But um, uh, yeah, we can have access to that. But it brings a, a, an additional cost, which yeah. is difficult or to some, for some wine growers, they, they don't see you know, the, the benefit of paying the additional cost. No, I can, I can understand. And it is such a long thing. I mean, it's not like, I can fly to Italy and taste wine there and I'm like, oh, I love this. I want to start making this in three years time on Saxonburg. I mean, it, yeah. it, it will be, it will yeah. be decades before, before you can actually commercially um, plant any of it and, and, and make wine from it. Yeah, the, the average is seven to 10 years. Okay. From the day that you've, from the day that you've, that's after, after negotiation, from the day that you have the new material landed in South Africa, it needs to go through our quarantine yeah. processes and when once they are cleared, so that can take easily three years just to get the material through our quarantine. Um, we have got a strict quarantine um, law and, and system. Uh, yeah, it's very complicated, but it takes a lot of time to get a new varietal or new clone so that it's possible for a wine grower to, to, to order the material from a nursery can take up to, from the day it land, it arrived in South Africa, can take up to seven, between seven and 10 years. Yeah, and then you add on top of that, another three years for the first crop and probably six years for a decent crop that you can actually make wine of. And so you're looking at, at 15, at least 15 years realistically, if, if after negotiations to start making that new cultivar. Yeah. So it is definitely a, a very long-term process. Um, yeah. But that we touched on, on with the quarantine and all of that, we, you touched a bit on that and, and some of the material being in quite a bad state. I mean, in the earlier days, 30, 40 years ago in the industry, there was a massive problem of, of a lot of virus vines coming out of nurseries um, being planted. Um, it seems to be a problem that, I mean, we're at a state now where nurseries, they give you plant material that's 100% certified virus-free. How, what, you know, what, what, what advances has been made in, at nurseries to be able to get to a point where we can say, listen, our, our plant material are certified to be without virus. How do they actually go about cleaning up the material? Yeah, it, this is, it, it remains in total a complicated uh, discussion. I think um, South Africa has got, has got one of the, the best wine um, improvement schemes in the world. It's, 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 um, it's really something to, to mention. And 
it's also through plant propagation laws. It's a, it's actually a law the way that things are done. Uh, okay. And it started in the it started in the 1970s when when the need um, you know was discussed and surfaced that we need to to, to select and to and to to work in a in a more organized way with our plant material. Um, so today we've got a we've got a system where we have the foundation vineyards or, or nuclear vineyards. Uh, excuse me. Yes, the top level is the nuclear. So that's those are vines. The it's like the vault of genetic material, the pool. So for every clone and varietal, the original vine that is in South Africa, it either belongs to one of the two major um, holders of, of, of the plant propagation institutions. Um, and the KDWV in the old days, you know, was the one, today it's, it belongs to Vititech Renpro, um, mm -hmm. which, which houses, I think, around 90% um, of the gene pool of South Africa's wine grape varieties. Um, and then, so those are, those vines are, are like the vault, it's the original, if, that, if, if those vines died, they are, we lose an entire variety or clone. So they are kept and renewed and managed and there's a huge cost. So they are in quarantine glass houses or, or greenhouses. Then the next level is the first generation material that comes from those um, nuclear blocks. We call it nuclear block, which is a greenhouse. Those are planted in very limited quantities out in the field, in nature, in uh, vineyard sites, which are um, far away, sort of in isolation. Mm. It becomes more and more difficult today to find areas where we can grow material because we also want to have the grapes from the material. Otherwise, it becomes a even more costly exercise to just grow material. So that are called foundation blocks. So they, they usually we try to establish for each clone and each um, variety the equivalent of material in the foundation level that will allow us to establish one hectare of vineyards. So from that one hectare of vineyards, which can be, which is called the mother vine, mother vineyard, that is used for the commercial orders for the millions of vines that are made annually by the, by the, um, the nurseries. So there are certain levels of, of inspection that's carried out. Some are on the top level, it's individual vine testing that has been done. And then on the, on the mother vine tier that produce or su supplies uh, maybe 70 to 80 percent of all the vines, vines that are produced at nurseries, those material are only visually inspected. So they come, you know, it's done by very um, well trained and experienced um, team individuals, guys that, that know what to look for. It's, it's, it's almost impossible, I think, cost wise in South Africa to test to test every single vine. So it is um, the reinfection risk for leaf roll virus and other diseases that can be transferred through material that's managed by keeping, by renewing these mother vines, mother blocks uh, on, a, at, you know, on a very um, short interval. So they will be kept, uh, a, a vineyard that's established as a mother vineyard will be kept for, for that purpose. Um, or used for that purpose for between three and maybe up to seven years, and then okay. it will be it will be not it will continue the farm who, who owns it to produce grapes, but it won't be continued to 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 use the material for propagation. So okay. the nurserymen, all of them, continually are establishing new mother blocks. So that is the process through which. Grape growers, uh, the, let me say the, the, the wine improvement scheme 
provides good quality wine grade material for, for our growers. It's actually massive. I mean, the, the planning that must go into having new blocks established every three to seven years is for the entire industry, is for each cultivar, for each club. I mean, that I, I don't even want to think about the, uh, the numbers of blocks that you need um, yeah. and that we'll need in the next two, three, four, five years. It is actually, <laughs> it's quite baffling to think of. So, um, just to... On, on to plants and, and, and you know, bringing it to, to a vineyard, how, when you look at a, when you look at a new plot, and I mean, you, you've worked with us at, at Saxonburg for a bit as well, so you know the property here, and how do we go about selecting clones and rootstocks and cultivars, or what, what would you say is, is the correct process of saying, okay, I've got this, you know, I've got a three hectare uh, pot, pot, uh, open field, um, how do you go about selecting cultivar, clone, and, and rootstock? I think just one step back there is we, today we've got, uh, and for the past maybe 10 years or even a bit more, we've got incredible evolution and development in, in technology that allows us to understand the possible um, abilities in in terms of what what each plot each each vineyard site uh, and i'm not talking about saxonberg because you've got many different sites you know on on the farm uh, as you go up the hill or on the southern slope or the more north facing slope so you you what we what we want to do today is to analyze the 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 terroir or the terrain yes. and then through the technology we can understand um, the, the attributes, how many sunlight hours, what kind of heat accumulation, what kind of exposure to, to wind, uh, and then the practical implications of the slope, how steep it is, you know, will determine which, which will be a, a workable practical row direction for the trellis system, the rows, and then um, that will will the, the, there are some things that dictate you know if it's too steep and can't go downhill we need to go uh, alongside the contours so then it will determine the exposure that the vine will get and then we could decide okay for this kind of exposure we don't want to go for uh, a wide variety but other it that's more um, you know that will handle the sun exposure better or maybe a white that will handle it better so that's the first thing is the to, to understand the site better to do that study. And the soil is usually the main um, factor that determines the rootstock. Uh, the, today um, we've discussed the, the fact that South Africa is a, is a water scarce country and our wine industry in the Western Cape is, is definitely, you know, we, we have a lovely raining day today, but it's, uh, it's incredible tough the last, since 2015, um, where had the normal old days, winters that we, that we heard about. So we, we need to think about a vineyard that we established now that hopefully will last 20, 30 and more years. And whatever climate change brings to us, we need to be wise and, and clever in terms of the selection of the rootstock. So we will, depending on the quality of the soil, which the clay content um, is the main driver and the stone fraction that's in the soil will, will determine what rootstock we use because we have rootstocks that are better suitable to certain soil types. So they will, and, and the rootstock induce the vigor that you see on top of the varietal that we've grafted on top of the rootstock. So the, um, um, it, it is a combination of what's your end result, what kind of varietal do we have in mind. Uh, yeah. Maybe we will have two options for a rootstock that we will have to choose between and it will be, between, it will be for instance, between do we have irrigation available, supplementary irrigation or not. And that will most of the time swing the, the decision to one, or, or one of the options. Or the other one is, um, vigor, the induced vigor, and 
and also ripening, uh, the time of ripening, because the rootstock plays a major role, significant role in when a variety ripens. You can pl plant two varietals on the same, next to one another on different rootstocks and they will ripen, you know, maybe one week apart, depending on the rootstock choice. Yeah, and then I think on the, on the varietal itself and the clone, it's always we need to, to have on a wine estate like Saxon, you need to have a master plan. You need to understand what's your focus, what's your strengths or your, your history, where, what, what, what are you known for, and how to build on that f further and strengthen your, your already great you know, wines that you've made, you're making of. You've got a history and uh, um, a reputation for making great shiraz. How do you further deepen that and, and strengthen that by selecting a, a new clone or new, um, yeah, new clone, excuse me, that's not yet planted on the estate, um, depending on the site. So you always need to also on your estate understand what's the cycle of vines that will have to be replanted in the next three, four, whatever, we, we usually say a five year plan. So you, you plant, you know, there's another vineyard that will have to be replanted in three years from now, which will be the better site for this specific one that you want to have in the pack, in the, in the mix. So you don't plant the, the one that you want now on the wrong place. And in three years time, the actual better site comes, comes uh, available and then you know then, then you're always chasing your tail so yeah. it's, a, it's a it's a proper planning and strategy and you need to every year look at that as a wine grower to have a sustainable uh, um, production and let's say ever ever improving yeah definitely i must say that for me it's, it's always a very exciting thing to sit with with that every year and you look at you look at the map, you look at what is planted, you look at what, is, what has worked, what hasn't worked, which plots are coming to the end of their life cycle. Um, and it's always, I mean, it, it, like you said, it's, you have got a three and a five year plan, but there's also a 10 and 15 and 20 year vision for where you want to be, because that's, I mean, in all, that, that's the life cycle of vineyards and hopefully longer. Yeah. If, if, I mean, it's very exciting if, if you imagine with what old vines are doing for the industry now and with everything that we know about vineyards and managing it. Uh, yeah. I mean, what the old vines we would have in 30 years from now would be, I, can you imagine how fantastic they would be? They would be planted on the, on, with use of all of these technologies that we now have at our disposal and all of the new plants, virus-free material. And it, so it's really exciting. I mean, as exciting as the industry is now, I think in 30 years from now, it's going to be really, really exciting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, just, but just on that, um, because you touched on it, like you, as an estate, you want to stay with, you know, what has worked and you want to, I think a, a lot of the estates sometimes, or well, a lot of us in South Africa are sometimes at fault where, where we diversify too much and we plant a little bit of everything on the farm and then you kind of see what works and what doesn't work. And, but that creates a lot of blocks on your farm that's not really, are profitable or doesn't really fit into your brand. Um, yeah. So on Saxonburg, I mean, you you know us very well, but just we we focus obviously on on Shiraz as the number one, and then Cab and Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay, and those four are the real the main four varieties that we focus on. But looking at climate change and you know how with as you as you've mentioned, we 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 haven't had a, a normal winter now for the last five years, so we we should probably accept that the, the normal is not the normal anymore. Um, is there, you know, can we buffer ourselves against climate change with careful selection of rootstocks and clones and newer clone material? Do you think there is a way where we can buffer ourselves by carefully selecting those, matching that with specific sites in the vineyard, and then so that we don't ne just necessarily have to change to cultivars that are more accustomed, but I mean, obviously changing a cultivar, you have to change your entire your entire package of, of what you as an estate offer. Yeah, now I think that's the last option in my view to change varietals. It's, um, 
it's the, the, the customer base uh, locally, but I think internationally as well, we are, we are stubborn and we don't like change. We don't like suddenly such a new, a new wine or new, um, a new wine, excuse me. So it's something, if it's, if it's a consideration, you know, to bring in uh, something new, it's something to bring in very slowly and very small and, uh, and phase it in over a long time, a long period, like a decade even. So, so that is part of that planning, that future planning, like you've mentioned. But I think through selection, absolutely, we can, there's a lot through careful selection. And if we think of the, you know, the mo most of the vines, the vineyards, uh, in 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 the the coastal region or in our wine industry, um, but let me rather say in the coastal region, most vineyards, older vineyards are twenty years and, and even older. So technology and the decision that was made and that was available at the time when they were planted, or the decision that the decision that were made, I think. We need to revisit. We need to to ask ourselves: Was it the best decision to plant this um, this rootstock? You know, you have become known, for instance, uh, to make a great shiraz. So, do you do you continue to to use the same clone, the same rootstock? Because the change of those two can bring uh, changes to or, or complexity, or offer you new and 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 better. Uh, abilities to, to handle the climate, the change in climate. Um, and the thing with the change in climate or climate change is that it's not, it's, it's not that we, we know, you know, what it will be next year. It's just that it's not, it's not normal, you know, it could be more wind, it could be extreme temperatures in, in October or, you know, it's, so we need to adapt in terms of a, a seasonal strategy. So that's where more intensive canopy management or viticultural practices on a seasonal basis, I think is almost the first step in, in adapting uh, to climate change because like we've you know, had, if you look back in the, in the history of uh, climate records, we, we could have had the same heat wave 40 or 60 years ago, or we could have had the same drought or the same rainfall, rainfall or wind. So it's not that it's the first time. There's very few things that happen the first time, and it's not staying that way. It's a, it's a, it's an incident. So yeah. we need to deal with that. We need to deal with that. We, our ancestors also need, needed to deal with it. And we need to adapt and deal with it on a seasonable basis. So you need to have your finger on the pulse. For us as, as wine growers and farmers out there, you need to check the weather forecast much more closely than maybe in the past when it wasn't so um, volatile. Yes. But, but I think we have a lot of options to answer your question. I think we've got a lot of options in clones, new clones, and uh, even changes, slight changes. We don't have that many options in rootstocks. But um, we do have to consider, but I think the strongest um, lies uh, in, in, in our ability to, to adapt in canopy management and in trailer systems to counter yeah. mitigate the, the effect of, of I think what, what you touched on there, it is a, it's a holistic approach. It's not a, oh, I change this one thing and then everything, everything else is automatically Fine. It is yeah. everything. Everything needs to be adapted um, to manage to manage going forward. Just we're we're actually out of time, so I'm just going to touch on the last few questions that came through. How many options of rootstocks do we actually have in South Africa? I was afraid of this what? question coming. I would say to you that there's more or less 15 rootstocks, and um, that's that's that you have as an option maybe around 12 to 15, the, the, I think 90% of all the, all the varieties, even including the table grapes, are grafted on five rootstocks. 
Yeah. Um, so there are many more that's available in, in terms of genetic, you know, the availability of rootstocks, but because of either poor, poor um, attributes, they are not, you know, used by farmers, they're not preferred. And it's, it's actually a sort of a dilemma that we are in as an as a industry um, globally. There are very few rootstocks that are, that, you know, very few options. Um, but if we look, if we say, now what else do we want in a rootstock? You know, would we want another option is we would want a rootstock that can grow without water, for instance. So if I can push it to the limit. So it's, it's um, we, what we want. I think we've got an incredible op op option, you know, the options between the, the five or six rootstocks that's, that's most widely used. Uh, are, they really offer for the variety of soils and needs that we have, but there are feeding programs uh, and re-evaluation programs in our research um, environment going on at the moment, because we, we constantly say, and, and that's the part of the vine that is in the ground that has to deal with heat and wind and you know water restrictions so we we are actively concerned and working on the rootstock options but it's 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 a i think the results will be in the next generation <laughs> <laughs> probably yes then um on a, on a little bit of a different topic do you think we should get to a point where we have, have approved vines or approved cultivars for specific regions something like the France's AOC system. Um, you, so let's say, you know, Stellenbosch should only have these and these varieties and that's it and it's, and it's controlled. Do you, do you think personal, I mean, that's just your, your, your personal opinion. What, what's your take on that? No, I don't think so. I think, <laughs> the, I think the diversity that we have and the diversity that, our, if you take France, Bordeaux for instance, I've been, I, I was in a, in a Shiraz vineyard in Bordeaux. It's right in the inner circle of Bordeaux where, the, you know, the, the Grand Cruz grows a Shiraz vineyard. It's not allowed, it can, it can only be vin de pay. So the, um, and similar with, with Chardonnay or cabs growing in the Rhone Valley, um, which you, you can't call it a cab, it's, it can be a dry red wine. So I think, if you, if you take Rhone Valley, it's a little bit more diverse in terms of the topography and what it offers. But South Africa is so incredible, the diversity that our soil types offers us, that our land offers us. It's, it would be, it would be, um, I don't want to be a winemaker in, in that world where you are limited to, to certain, you know, to, to three or five varietals for a region. I think it will be sad to have that. Um, so yeah, I think we have, we've got incredible, if you look at the blends that we are making in this country, uh, where you can really make a great blend, you don't have to call it any region known blend that exists in the old world, but you can add wines from different historical regions like in the old world, but to make a better wine. So yeah, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not for that. I think we are in a better place at the moment. Yeah, I think, I think um, you know, I think diversity is probably one of our greatest strengths as, as an industry. It also makes our marketing me message that much, that much more difficult, you know. It's much easier if you know Bordeaux, mm -hmm. that's it. That's all, they, that's all they do. So it's a much more streamlined marketing effort. But I think quality-wise, um, and like you said, that the diversity we have is just too much. I, 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 if you, I mean, I've, my, my career has been based in Salamosh, but if you take Helderberg and you take Bottler Ray and you take Simonsburg, they're all completely different. Um, they all produce phenomenal wine, um, but they are very diverse. And this is within, I mean, this is within a, a stone's throw, throw from each other within the same region in South Africa. Um, so I think it would, would be very, very difficult to really go and, 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 and say, oh, but this is all you're now allowed to grow and, and sell as, as a wine of origin. Um, so that's just, that's my take. I agree with you on that one. Um, so hopefully we don't get there. But okay, I think that's it. If there are no any 
other questions, Yuan, do you have a final word you want to say? No, I think it's a it's a great evening for port and uh, a fireplace tonight and pancakes. <laughs> no, just keep on just keep on enjoying your wines. Thank you very much for the for the opportunity. To... Uh, thank thank you so much, Yuan. And just um, just before we go, um, please you know as always support support uh, the local wine industry in where. Um, you can uh, buy Saxonburg online now, especially in this time. It's, it's great to be able to buy wine online. And if you do enjoy Saxonburg wine, share it with us, us on Instagram or on the social on social media and rate us on Vivino as well. That would be very appreciated. And then um, we've got, uh, uh, as always now, as is custom on our webinars, we've got a special gift for someone. Um, so John Watson uh, will send a magnum of, of Saxonburg your way in the near future. So I hope you enjoy that. And uh, thank you so much, Juan. And yeah, next week, uh, next week we've got a really interesting discussion as well. Um, I've got Michael Fernandez from uh, Big Art South Africa here. So we're going to talk a little bit about barrels. So we're done with the vineyards now. So now we're going to go into the winery, talk about barrels, where we source our oak from and, and all the influences that has um, on, on the final product. So thanks again, Johan, and thank you to everyone tuning in. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Thanks, Dave. Bye-bye.